Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Well, that was uh, certainly some nice singing. And, and I have to mention, too, I was talking to somebody before the service about public speaking and how its studies have shown it's the number one fear in, in America. But y'all who did the scripture reading out here, especially the young ones, did an incredible job. Well, when Ken called me a couple of weeks ago or so and invited me to come up and, and, and speak, I had planned on starting a series. I would thought about the book of 1 John because currently it's kind of the plan that I come once a month, so I thought there'd be some continuity between the messages. But he, he had mentioned to me to come and share what's God's been doing in my life through the loss of my wife. And after prayer and contemplation, I, I decided to take him up on his suggestion. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned through the grieving process, some of the things I'm still learning, and certainly what Scripture has to say about grieving. Let me go ahead and open in a word of prayer and then... We'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to share your word, to fellowship with fellow believers. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with me this morning, give me the strength, give me the boldness, give me your words, Lord, that you would have the honor and the glory and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name I praise. Amen. Now, for those of you who don't know, I was here... September 10th, and it was that following Friday that my wife went home to be with the Lord. Still difficult. But if, you remember, if those of you who were here remember, the message that I spoke on was from Romans 8.28. And it was about a man named Horatio Spafford, who was a prominent businessman and lawyer in Chicago in the 1800s. He was very wealthy, he owned many properties, and he lost all that in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. After a couple of years of trying to rebuild, they decided to take a vacation, so they were going to go over to England, and they were going to go by ship. Well, at the last minute, he couldn't go, but his wife and two daughters could. Partway across the ocean, the, the ship sank, and he lost two of his daughters. They came back. They, tried to rebuild again, had more children, and then he lost a son to scarlet fever. Well, as if that wasn't bad enough, the church that he was an elder in asked him to leave because they, they considered all the struggles and trials that he was going through to have been the punishment from God for some egregious sin. Well, I've... Uh, I know it's like to go through struggles, certainly not those kind of struggles. And I think we all do, or all will at one time or another. But I think, I believe, God used that message and the preparation of it to help prepare me for what was going to happen Friday. But I can say with confidence that, that Darlene is now with the Lord. And how I can say that is because I was with her when she accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. See, the church I belong to in Virginia, Bethel Baptist Church, so we used to put on an annual production of, of Judgment House. I don't know if you all have ever heard of Judgment House, but it's a, it's a walk-through drama, and it typically has eight different scenes, and you go from room to room. And the first scene, well, the whole storyline, regardless of, 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 of the particulars of, of each drama, takes you through the lives and deaths of three teens, one who was saved, one who thought that he or she was saved, and one who was not saved. Now, <clears throat> the first scene kind of introduces you to the main characters and kind of sets up the storyline. And each each scene is played by different people, so how you identify the main characters is by the color of clothing that they wear. <coughs> the, 
The second scene usually depicts um, the teens being involved in some tragic incident. This particular year um, it was a car accident. The third scene involves the notification of the families and usually, uh, you know, the car crash and that the teens had been taken to a hospital for treatment. The next scene is at the hospital and then we learn that the injuries were too severe and, and they had passed away. The fifth scene is usually a, a funeral scene and then the sixth scene is a judgment scene. And this is where God pours out his judgment based on whether or not the, the teens had accepted Jesus as their savior. So the one who had accepted Jesus was allowed into heaven. The one who thought he or she was saved because of good works or because he was, they were a good person was not allowed into heaven and God explained to them why. And then the one who wasn't saved was usually defiant, was, was of course, sent to hell. The seventh scene is the hell scene, which uh, they, did, they did a really fantastic job with. And kind of scary that some of the strong believers played Satan or anybody else, but uh, they did a really good job in portraying even just a glimpse of the torment and torture and, and uh, what people would have to go through uh, there. The final scene, was a heaven scene. And this was a scene where, uh, where Jesus welcomes the one who was saved. And they're surrounded by angels worshiping Jesus. And, and we also see that they're reunited with loved one, uh, believing loved ones who had arrived in heaven before them. Now, after, after walking through all these, uh, the viewers of the uh, drama are... are escorted into a room, and the pastor would <clears throat> summarize what, what they had just experienced so they had a good understanding. They would share, clearly share the gospel and invite them to make a decision. And it was at one such judgment house as Darlene accepted Jesus Christ. So it's for that reason and for seeing her mature as a Christian that I can have confidence in knowing where she is now. See, grief is going to visit each of us during our life. Grief may be caused by the loss of a loved one and the loss of a friend or a coworker. But grief is not only caused by death. See, it, grief is an emotional response to any kind of significant loss, such as the loss of a job, maybe the loss of a relationship. Maybe it's caused by the loss of a car, a house, or maybe failing health. In my case, my current grief is due to the loss of my wife. Grief is very real, and it's also very difficult to prepare for. There are, however, many verses and passages throughout Scripture that can bring comfort to those who are grieving. For example, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 reads, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. One that uh, is very, very familiar to many of us is Psalm 23, usually here read at uh, graveside services. But it's also for times when, you, when you're grieving, when you're hurting, that Realize that God will be with you. It reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, if we look at this, 
Let's take a look at the beginning of it where it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What kind of a picture does that paint in your mind? I know for me, it paints a picture of peace and tranquility, of calmness. And that's what the Lord can do for us. That's what he wants to do for us. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. When you experience the loss of someone, you're walking through that valley. But you don't have to be afraid. You're not walking it alone. Another verse out of the Psalms is Psalm 34, 18, where the first part of it says that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Psalm 147, 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. <clears throat> See, these verses have bringing, been bringing comfort to me because they're promises of a faithful God who has promised to be faithful to us and they will always be near to comfort us. Even so, <clears throat> Darling's, Darling's passing is, has been still very difficult. On one hand, I've been leaning heavily on a couple of God's promises, one from Revelation 21.4 and one from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. One from Revelation 21.4 reads, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for former things have passed away. Now realize the context of that message is way in the future. It's after the millennial kingdom. It's, it's when God is bringing the new Jerusalem down to the new earth. But even so, it's comforting to know that us as believers will be able to participate in that and experience that. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17, we read another comforting event that occurs when Jesus returns. It could be today. Could be tomorrow, could be next year, could be a thousand years from now. We don't know. But we read, Paul writes here, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, unbelievers. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, <coughs> excuse me, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and, then, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Something I want to point out about the beginning of that passage. You notice that Paul doesn't say do not grieve. He says do not grieve as those who have no hope. So grieving is very real and we're not commanded not to. It's just part of the process. And believe me, I'm speaking to myself as much as to you. And as believers, we have the promise of being reunited with Jesus, and by extension, being reunited with our, love, our believing loved ones that have preceded us. On the other hand, not only was I grieving for Darlene, but also at times feeling guilty because of the length of time that I would get emotional over losing Darlene. In a way, that guilt kind of made me feel selfish because I want her here with me, but yet I know she's in a place now where there's no pain, no suffering. You know, in what better place would you want somebody that you love? I would also catch myself falling into a trap, a trap where I knew what I was feeling. I knew the hurt, the pain that I was feeling. 
And we had several gentlemen in our church who have recently lost their wives. And I'd fall into the trap of knowing how I was feeling and looking at them and not seeing that same pain when I knew it was there. And I talked to a very dear friend of mine the other day. She, she has a, a podcast with, uh, with a gentleman and talks about the Christian things, usually about uh, you know, the fourth quarter of people's lives. It's a really nice podcast. And she wrote a book on Christmas. But years ago, we got to talking about um, a ministry. And so now every time we see each other, we, we have that kind of conversation. And then she learned about Darlene. And she came in to my office about a week and a half ago. And there was nobody else there. So we were talking for a few minutes. And, and I shared this with her. And she says, you know, she says, except for the fact that you lowered your guard and trusted me enough to, to share with me how you feel, I would never know there's anything going on with you. So it was just putting a voice to something I already knew that was very encouraging to me not to fall into that trap. But see, that trap isn't just for those who are grieving. We can experience that every day of our lives by comparing ourselves and our known weaknesses to other people's perceived strengths and already put us on the defense, put us lower than we should be. We do that when we come to church. We see people all dressed in their nice clothes and smiles on their face, and you're coming here hurting. And you're thinking, wow, I wish I could be like that person. Got it all together when in reality that person might be hurting just as badly as you are. <clears throat> I would and sometimes still do come to tears at a recollection of a memory or maybe a song or you know, maybe something I wanted to share with Darlene and Kate. Oh, I could voice it, pretend I'm talking to her, but I can't have that conversation with her like I used to. There were times when <clears throat> I'd get emotional over loving gestures, such as sympathy cards or a Christmas card that maybe had a message in it about Darlene. Sometimes when somebody brings me a meal. And even as a believer, it's, it's not too difficult to allow ourselves to <coughs> become calloused by the negativity of this world. And through the, you know, in that light, the outpouring of, of love from my, from my church, from my family, from friends and neighbors and coworkers, would sometimes get overwhelming. But it was always appreciated. Another thing I've learned is that the level of grief is evidence of how significant the relationship was. If you suffer the loss of a loved one, there should be grief, and there will be grief. Even Jesus grieved. In John chapter 11, we read about the death of his dear friend Lazarus. Even though Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he still grieved because the pain and suffering that Mary and Martha and others were experiencing when he arrived at the Lazarus' grave. In John eleven thirty five, 35, it says Jesus wept. Now, this does not mean that he had a, a single tear, tear trickle down his face. Mm -mm. It means that he was wailing in grief. And why is that? It's because when you lose a loved one, it hurts. It would have been very easy for Jesus to tell Mary and Martha to stop all that crying and watch what I'm about to do. But he didn't, because it does hurt. I've also learned that <clears throat> it's very difficult for, and it was very difficult for me to learn that when you're grieving, it's okay not to be okay. We always want to be strong. We always want to act like we have it all together, but 
there are times when you just don't. It took me a great deal of time and a lot of help to, to realize that. And I still struggle with it. But realizing this is really giving yourself an emotional license to feel mad, glad, sad, angry, and afraid. See, these are the five core feelings that people experience when grieving. Yet, oftentimes, people want to suppress them because they hurt too much. I can attest to you that they do. But the more I tried to suppress these feelings, the more painful it was when they finally burst forth. One thing to remember is that in grieving, there's no such thing as bad feelings. There's no such thing as wrong feelings. Now, how we respond to those feelings is something else entirely. For an example, if you get caught off, get cut off in traffic, you feel like really telling that person off, but you don't. Or maybe you go to your favorite place to get a coffee and donut on the way to work, only to find out that they're out of both, and you feel like exploding, but you don't. Oftentimes when people are grieving, they want to suppress their feelings because they hurt. But here's the problem with doing that. If you suppress your feelings to the point where you're numb so that you don't feel the pain, you might not feel the hurt, but guess what? If you're numb, you can't experience love, acceptance, encouragement, and support. Numb is numb. If you suppress your feelings, you suppress the good feelings right along with the painful ones. <coughs> Studies have shown that, and I didn't like this, that, that during the 18 to 24 months before those who are grieving start to heal, grief affects every part of the body. It affects people emotionally, psychologically, and it affects them physically. And along with that study, there was an acronym that, that was shared, and the acronym that, that helps people through the grieving process, and that acronym is DEER, D-E-E-R. The D stands for drink. You need to drink plenty of water, especially if, if you've been crying, because it's very easy to become dehydrated. I drink water all the time. I'm rarely without a bottle of water. I have one over there. And they were gracious enough to have some up here. So that wasn't a problem for me. E, E stands for eat. <coughs> it's not uncommon for people who are grieving to lose their appetite. On the morning that Darlene passed away, after the police officer and the funeral, di funeral director left my home, I went to my favorite diner. Now, I didn't know if I was hungry, but I knew I didn't want to stay home alone. And I chose the diner because I knew she would have wanted me to eat. The next E stands for exercise. Exercise is very important while you're grieving because it's too easy to, to lose energy and lose drive. Exercise is good for you anyway. I can't exercise like I used to because of uh, health reasons, but I do get a lot of exercise at work, which at times can be physically demanding. And there's a lot of walking involved, and so I'm doing a lot of moving around. R stands for rest. Getting enough rest is very difficult while grieving. For several weeks, after losing Darlene, I'd go to bed around 10 or 11 at night and I'd be wide awake at 2 o'clock in the morning and not able to go back to sleep. See, getting the proper amount of sleep and proper amount of rest is very important in the healing process for your body. Now I want to conclude this morning with a parable out of the book of Luke. Now while I would like to believe that everybody in this room is a believer, I know that there's a very real possibility 
that there may be someone here who has not placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ. It is for this reason that I want to use this parable to illustrate the, the difference that one decision can make on your eternal destiny. The parable I'm referring to is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. This is out of Luke 16, beginning at verse 19. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, not the same Lazarus, by the way, <coughs> full, of, full of sores, who was laid at, at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one raised from the dead. Now, first thing we notice in this parable is that there are two very different men. They were different in the, how the, in the way they lived their lives. The first man we read about is the rich man. Again, verse 19 says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Here we learn a few things about this man. We can learn that he was rich. We see that he wore fine clothes and he lived in luxury. <clears throat> this is a man who had everything money could buy. He had taken a hold of, of life and lived it to the fullest. He seemingly had no worries from a human perspective. Most people would like to live this way. Many would wish that they could do anything they would like, go anywhere they would like, and not be concerned about the cost. So he did things his own way, thinking he didn't need anyone. Now the second man that we read about is Lazarus. In verse 20 and 21 it says, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So we can also learn a few things from this man. We learned that he was a beggar. He had no place to live. He was sick and full of sores. He was satisfied with the crumbs from the rich man's table. His only friends were dogs. His only source of medical care were those dogs. Here's a man who, who no one wants to be like. He had nothing. He was looked down upon by everyone around him, and he had no friends. See, Jesus told this story to let us know that there are two types of people in the world, those who depend on themselves and those who depend upon others. The beggar trusted God to provide for his needs, 
as we learn in the outcome of his death. And these men also differed greatly in the choices that they made. Each one of us have the same choice to make as these two men did, the choice for Christ. Verse 22 says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Here we see the beggar had died and was carried away to Abraham's bosom. And we learn later that this is a place where Jesus called paradise in Luke 23, 43. When he said to the thief on the cross who asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his own kingdom, Jesus replies by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise, or Abraham's bosom, is a place where those who believe in Jesus Christ to save them from their punishment of sin and give their lives to him as Lord and Savior. Lazarus had made this choice. Verses 24 to 31 show the results of making a different decision. It says, Then Abraham cried, or Laz, uh, the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that it is your, in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here, from here to you cannot, nor can those from there to pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that, that you would send him to my father's house and for I have five brothers, and they, may, he may testify uh, to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, let them read Scripture, learn from Scripture, and accept Jesus that way, just like we do. And he said, no, Father Abraham. <coughs> but if one goes to them from the dead... They will repent. But, he, but Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one who raised from the dead. See, here we see that the rich man died and was buried. We also see that he was being tormented in Hades, which is a place of torment. We see that he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and Lazarus afar off and cried out, begging for mercy. But he quickly learned that there is no mercy after death. He also learned that the decisions made in life affect our eternal destiny. And the rich man did not make a decision for Christ and had to pay for his sins himself for eternity. We all have a choice to make concerning eternity. We can choose to believe in Jesus as Lazarus did, to follow him as Lord and Savior, to live for him and uh, live with him in heaven for all eternity, united with God, united with believing loved ones who had gone before us. Or we can live for ourselves as the rich man did and suffer torment in hell eternally, separated from God and separated from our loved ones. I sincerely hope everyone makes a decision to accept Jesus so that for one reason, so that when grief comes over the loss of a loved one who believes that you have that blessed assurance of being reunited with them once again. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I once again thank you for this, for this time. Thank you for your word. I thank you for the grieving process, Lord. It's, it's a painful thing, but it's something that has a way of drawing us closer to you. And Lord, I depend upon you. And I, Lord, I pray, that, I pray that everyone here, I would like to think that they wouldn't go through grief of some sort or another, but as we all know, it's bound to happen. I pray that you would be with them and, and hopefully 
something I shared here today will encourage them and help them through that process. And Lord, I just, as, as we leave here today, Lord, I, well, I pray for the, for the family meeting that's coming up, that you would be in the midst of it and give wisdom on whatever decisions have to be made. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.